Welcome to Back to the Bible. Today's study is an important message for our time as Bible teacher Brian Clark highlights the incredible power of your choices. Later in the program, Brian will be in the studio with Arnie Cole and Kara Whitney for some valuable take-home points. Now here's Brian Clark with today's study from Genesis chapter 4. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. And Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. Cain brought from the fruit of the ground, Abel brought from his flock. Some people say the reason that God rejected Cain's offering was because it wasn't a blood sacrifice. I don't think that's necessarily true. For a couple of reasons. If you notice, the author is very careful to call both of them offerings. He doesn't call one an offering and one a sacrifice. He's using the same terminology as if to indicate both were acceptable offerings. But we also know from the law that a grain offering was acceptable to God. And that is what Cain did. Cain was a tiller of the ground. It would make sense he would bring a grain offering, which later in the law was acceptable. There's no reason to believe it wouldn't be acceptable here. But also know that, notice that the emphasis is on the fact that what Abel brought was the best he had. We know that the concept of the firstling and the fatty portions are both in reference to the best that he had to offer God. What Cain brought was just whatever he could spare. We can be like Cain, can't we? We can be like Cain in that we give God whatever's convenient. We give God whatever's left over. We give God whatever time we can spare. We give God whatever resources we can spare. Whatever our time and talent isn't used up in the things of the world, we'll give it back to God. But we need to look at how God responded to Cain because what God said is, Cain, I don't want it. I'm God. And either you give me the best that you have, you give me your heart. In other words, we don't just squeeze God in. God is everything. God is central, and we squeeze everything around God. That's what he's asking. I want the best of your time. I want the best of your energy. I want the best of you, because I want your heart, and I want you to worship me. Cain didn't much want to hear this. He didn't like having his heart exposed any more than we do. Verse 5, so Cain became very angry. It's a word that means fiery with anger. And his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? I love verse 6 and 7. I don't know how you can not be in love with a God like this. As a matter of fact, every time we think about the reality of an eternal place of punishment, an eternal hell, we need to remove that image that has God sitting on his throne and with a smile on his face casting sinners into hell and recapture this image in verses 6 and 7. Because the scripture says that God desires that all people be saved. God didn't create hell for people, and God's desire is that no one would go there. And verses 6 and 7 give us a picture of God responding to Cain like a father would respond to a rebellious child saying to Cain, Cain, it doesn't have to be this way. Cain, I won't accept that offering, but you need to understand if you'll just change your heart, if you'll just change your way, if you'll just come to me, I'll forgive your sin and it will be well with you. You can enter into my joy. You can enter into my peace. You can enter into everything I have to offer. This is not a God of anger and wrath just wanting to squash Cain. This is a heavenly daddy meeting with his child saying, Cain, I'm concerned about the way you're going. It doesn't have to be this way. This is the picture of God in Genesis 3 when God comes looking for Adam and Eve and says, where are you? God is saying, Cain, it doesn't have to be this way. You're on a path of destruction, and if you just change and repent, it'll be all right. You'll experience my compassion. That's the heart of God, and God God does everything that he can do for us to turn around and receive his grace and mercy and forgiveness. God doesn't want to send anybody to an eternal place of punishment. 
But he's also very clear in this passage that if Cain doesn't listen, that's where he's going. Verse 7, and if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, and you must master it. We've seen that word desire and master. It was in chapter 3, verse 16. Desire means a desire to dominate, to take over, and master means to, to rule it or to dominate it back. He uses the imagery of an animal crouching, ready to pounce. Perhaps a lion that's sitting outside the door and it's in a, it's in a crouched position waiting for Cain to walk out the door and the lion will attack him and maul him and consume him. And that's the picture he gives of sin. Understand what he's talking about here is a very critical window of opportunity. At this point, Cain can still hear the voice of God. And God is talking to Cain. He's pleading with him as a loving daddy would a child that's going down a path of destruction. And he's saying, Cain, you need to understand, come back. Give me your heart. Because if you don't, sin is there like a wild animal and it's going to take over and you will no longer hear my voice. You will no longer respond to me, and you will go down a path of destruction, and what's implied is that eternal death that God warned them of. It reminds us that there is a window of opportunity where we're responsive to the voice of God. We've all seen it before in people we know. There is that time when they're wrestling with choices. They're wrestling with, really, the ultimate choice. Will I submit to God and walk in obedience to him and reach out and accept his Savior, or will I say I can be God myself and I'll do it my own way? And there are those moments where people are wrestling with that decision, and they're convicted by the voice of God, and they're deciding which path am I going to travel. But there is a tendency to think, you know, someday I'll make that decision. Right now I'm going to be God and maybe someday I'll change my mind. But what God is saying, Cain, is it isn't going to work that way. Sin is like a wild animal crouching at the door. And when you step out that door, it's going to maul you and you won't hear my voice anymore. When I was living in Chicago, at first, uh, all you heard all night long were sirens. Because we were right downtown and you just heard sirens constantly. But after a while, you don't hear them anymore. And you don't even realize that until visitors come and they stay in your room and they say, man, I didn't sleep all night. All I heard was sirens. How do you sleep in a place like this? Say, you know, I don't even hear them anymore. And that's what God's talking about. God's talking about the fact that there are these windows of opportunity when we hear the voice of God and we need to respond. Because the story is being told that Cain made his choice and that lion mauled him and Cain then no longer heard the voice of God and he went down a path that would cost him an eternal destruction separated from God. Every time I think of the concept of hell and eternal punishment, I need to remember verses 6 and 7. That's the proper view of God in God's heart and God's desire. This is what he wants from us. Yet thousands of people will choose the way of Cain and suffer the consequences of that. You're listening to Back to the Bible. If you'd like to listen again, visit backtothebible.org. That's backtothebible.org. Now back to our study in Genesis 4 with Brian Clark. And Cain told Abel his brother, And it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and he killed him. Now, why did Cain do that? I mean, it wasn't Abel that had rejected his sacrifice. It wasn't Abel that was confronting uh, Cain because of his sin. You remember when God spoke to the serpent in 315, he said there's going to be a battle between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And Abel represented the seed of the woman. Cain is the seed of the serpent. And when we decide for ourselves that we can be like God, and we are self-righteous, we don't like those who remind us that that isn't true. There were a group of people in the first century that had convinced themselves that they could be gods, and that they could achieve a measure of self 
righteousness and be acceptable before God. And everything was fine until the divine curve wreckers stepped on their turf. And when that perfect man walked among them, they responded just like Cain. Jesus exposed the fact that they weren't righteous at all. And they either could change their hearts or they could eliminate that reminder. And so they nailed that reminder to a cross. It's the same thing Cain did clear back in the beginning. Cain didn't want to be reminded. So he took Abel out in the field and he took him out. Verse 9, then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? That implies a no answer, but that's not what he gets. Verse 10, and he, God said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. You shall be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. Behold, thou hast driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from thy face I shall be hidden. And I shall be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and it will come about that whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, lest anyone finding him should slay him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. The name Nod means wanderer. It's just a land of wanderers. Now, what all is going on here? There's a couple of things. First of all, in verse 3, it says, so it came about in the course of time. How much time, we don't really know. But what we find out is Cain was worried that someone would track him down and kill him. So the question is, who are these people? There were obviously other brothers and sisters that were populating the earth. He also, in a couple of verses, is going to have a wife, which had to have been one of his sisters, and that's a necessary part of populating the earth in the beginning. So there was enough time that there were other people on the earth, so we'll satisfy that curiosity question. But to go on to the real point of the text, Cain made his choice. Cain decided to go the way of sin, to say, I will be God, I will be responsible for life and death. He takes out Abel, God confronts him, but it's interesting to notice exactly what God talks about when he confronts him. Because if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, and we are told we are made in the image of God, what's the next thing that God says? that you will rule, that you will rule over creation, you will cultivate the ground. In chapter 2, God says, I need to create a man that will cultivate the garden. That's an expression of the image. We get into chapter 3, and God confronts Adam and says, because of your sin, you'll still do that. The image is still in effect, but it's going to be hard. It's going to be a battle. But what does he say now to Cain? Cain, you can't even rule over the ground anymore. In other words, you have so misused the image that Cain, you no longer will rule over the ground. It will no longer produce for you. You just wander around and pick up whatever you can find. See, there's this theme of the image all throughout this. God's greatest gift is also the source of our greatest abuse when we decide we can be God. When Jude talks about Cain, he talks about woe to those who go the way of Cain. They become like unreasoning animals doing what comes instinctual. In other words, rather than responding according to the image, they just act like the animals. And that's exactly what's going on in this chapter. As a matter of fact, if the greatest expression of the image of God is to be intimate with God, then the greatest punishment would be to be separated forever from God. And that's exactly what hell is. It's an eternal separation from God. And there's an imagery, there's a picture here where Cain has made his decision. God came to Cain and in very loving fashion, he, he, he pled with Cain to come back to, to reconcile this relationship and experience all that God wants to give him. But, but he made his choice. And his choice was to decide he will be God himself. And for those people, God says, there is no hope. There is no hope if they won't turn to me. 
So Cain has made his decision. He receives his punishment. Cain says, that punishment is too great for me. He doesn't repent of his sin. He just says, it's too great for me. And God says he was sent away from the presence of God. It's a picture of his eternity. Now, what exactly this mark was on Cain so that no one would kill him, nobody really knows what that was. Let's just pick it up in verse 16. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. Now to Enoch was born Irad, and Irad became the father of Mechujael, and Mechujael became the father of Methushael. Name your kids one of those. And Methushael became the father of Lemek. And Lemek took to himself two wives. And the name of the one was Adah, and the name of the other was Zillah. And Adah gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of those who play the lyre and the pipe. As for Zillah, she gave birth to Tubal Cain, the forger of all implements of bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nema. And Lemek said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to my voice, you wives of Lemek. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. What's going on there is God is saying, this is what I was concerned about, and he brings the story of Cain up close and personal, and he really fleshes out, this is his concern, and this is the way of Cain. This is the seed of the serpent. And then he kind of tracks through the line without a whole lot said, but kind of talks about what these people did, and you kind of see culture starting to form and all of that. But then he gets down here to Lemek, and he pulls Lemek out and gives a big picture again and says, look at down the line, nothing's changed. Lemek had two wives, completely destroying what God said in Genesis 2.24, where the two will become one flesh. So Lemek's making a mess of that because he's God. He can do what he wants. And more than that, Lemek has written a little song to his wives, and in the song he brags about a young man that he killed. And in the Hebrew, it talks about that this young man wounded Lemek in a sense that it was an insignificant wound. It's a word that means it was really not very much of a big deal. But Lemek turned around and he killed him, and he's so proud of that that he writes a little song about it. And it's exposing the depravity of his heart, and he goes so far to say, if Cain got away with it, then I can get away with it. If Cain is avenged seven times, then I am 77 times. And God is saying, the more I pour out my mercy, the more they take advantage of it. The more I allow them to go down this path, the more they think they are God. And where will this all end? That was God's concern in chapter 3. That's what he was talking about. If people don't realize they are not God, that they cannot decide for themselves what is right and wrong, then they will die an eternal death. And God reveals his heart with Cain by showing, this is what never what I wanted. And I've done everything possible for people to realize this is not the way I want you to go. I want you to experience my compassion. I want you to experience my forgiveness. I want you to experience my grace. Just change your heart and come home. But for those who choose to reject me and go the way of Cain, woe to them. For them, there is no hope. You're listening to Back to the Bible. If you'd like to listen again, visit backtothebible.org. That's backtothebible.org. Now Brian Clark joins us in the studio with author Kara Whitney and Back to the Bible CEO Arnie Cole. Brian, your message today ended with a warning. But this study also seems to be saying that having a relationship with God is even more than being saved from hell. Talk more about the conversation God had with Cain. Yeah, so I find that conversation between God and Cain to be so insightful to just the heart of God. I mean, imagine this is the God of the universe, and he's dealing with someone he's created who seems bent on offending him and living life on his own terms. And yet God doesn't come with 
anger and wrath. It's almost like God gets down on one knee before Cain and says, Cain, it doesn't have to be like this. Right. It can be different. What he wants for Cain is life. And so this idea that God's just this wrathful God of judgment waiting to clobber somebody really all goes away in that conversation. And you see much more of God's heart for those who who sin, for those who offend him. So even hell stands as a testament to God's love? I would say that it's precisely because God is a God of love that God has wrath. So think of it this way. We all have kids. If someone breaks into my house and is attacking my girls, Mm -hmm. I'm going to respond, and I'm going to respond with anger. I'm going to respond with what is necessary to stop that. That's not driven by indifference. That's driven by love. It's because I love them that I'm not going to sit idly by and watch someone do damage to them. So in the same way, if God was indifferent towards sin, God would just sit back and watch. But God is love. And so God sees people in the world doing such violence and damage to people he genuinely loves that that causes God to respond with anger and wrath. It's because he's loving. To do nothing is a mark of indifference, and indifference is a mark of hate. So true. Can you talk a little more about this idea of having a window of opportunity to hear God's voice? You know, I've often said to people, it's not whether you blow it or not, it's what you do when you blow it that's going to define your story. And so there's clearly this moment where God is almost begging Cain to rethink the path that he's headed down and reminding Cain it doesn't have to be this way. But Cain's determined to travel that path, and that will define his story. Uh, So I think there's moments in life where God reveals himself, where something happens, and people are at these pivotal moments where they're going to take one path or the other. And, you know, over the years, I've had these people sit in my office, and sometimes they choose the path of Cain, and it's years of disaster. And the reality is it didn't have to be that way. But other moments where people are truly broken and repentant, and their story is a story of redemption, and it's a beautiful story. You're listening to Back to the Bible. We're glad you joined us today. Be sure to come back again tomorrow as Bible teacher Brian Clark leads us into another life-transforming study from God's Word here on Back to the Bible. Back to the Bible.